Multiple case study is a very commonly used qualitative research design in business research. Multiple case study is perhaps the most quantitative of all qualitative research designs. For a quantitative researcher who wants to go to qualitative research, this multiple case study is per perhaps then the most natural approach. The example article is Eisenhardt and Burgoyne's 1988 Politics of Strategic Decision Making in High Velocity Environments Toward the Mid-Range Theory, published in Academic Management Journal, which is one of the top journals in management and it publishes all kinds of studies. This study is, as I said, a multiple case study. So it means that um, it follows certain cases and it tries to describe those cases, what goes on in those cases, and then there are multiple cases, more than one case, that are then compared. And uh, the authors present a theory about politics. And they look at startups or small technology companies and why there are politics going on in those organizations. So politics is generally thought of something that causes friction in decision making. Like you might withhold information from somebody, form co coalitions with somebody else and try to uh, use this kind of covert tactics to influence decision making. It's generally thought that this hurts performance. And it's also something that executives might not like. And this study looks at why certain startups or smaller companies might have politics in their decision making. Before we get into the study, I want to talk about the nature of quant qualitative research. So one problem with qualitative research is that in contrast to quantitative research, where there is typically a set of well-established procedures for carrying out data collection and analysis, there is no such boilerplate for qualitative studies. But there have been emerging a couple of like standard ways of doing studies. And this uh, originates from uh, a couple of researchers, Eisenhardt and Gioia, who have been very successful in publishing qualitative studies in job journals. And then other researchers have started to follow kind of copy of what Kathleen Eisenhardt or Denny Gioia are doing. And these create kind of like templates that researchers can follow. There is some debate on whether this is a good thing or not. And Qualitative researchers, some of them don't like the idea of these templates because they think that qualitative research should be rich and there should be a variety of different approaches that are acceptable instead of forcing people or encouraging people to go to certain templates. But if you're a beginner, beginner to research, understanding these templates is useful for two reasons. The first reason is that a lot of studies follow these templates. And the second reason is that if you are doing your own study, then having a template to follow gets you started before you develop your competence of designing your own qualitative study from first principles. Let's take a look at the Eisenhardt template, the Eisenhardt method, because this uh, article is written by Kathy Eisenhardt and it follows this template. The um, method tries to uh, build a theory in the form of propositions. And the idea is that the theory applies to many different settings, not just the cases. So we are, we are trying to uh, construct a theory that is generally applicable and could be tested later using quantitative techniques. The philosophical assumptions are post-positivistic or realistic. We assume that the reality is the same for everybody. So for example, if two informants tell us different things, we would assume that one of them is incorrect, one of them is correct, and we would triangulate to find out what is really going on in the data, instead of uh, trying to understand why these people perceive the situation differently. The number of cases is typically 4 to, to 10, so this requires multiple cases, and it's based on interviews and other data from the cases. So we try to build these case descriptions, narratives of different events in the cases, and then we compare the cases. And this is, is justified in terms of validity and reliability by triangulating, looking at different kinds of evidence and not just for perhaps only interviews. Finally, uh, the results in this approach are typically presented in tables. So you normally have 
clear concepts or constructs that you want to quantify in these cases. And you might want to first show that there is variation in the degree of politics in these cases, and there is variation in degree of uh, power centralization, for example, in these cases. And then you would uh, show that these are associated by presenting a table. And once you show associations, then afterwards you present a narrative of the theory, like what is going on, supported by quotations from the data. So this is in a nutshell the Eisenstadt approach. This study that I'm now going to explain to you belongs to the inductive case research. So the idea here is that this is inductive in the sense that we build theory from data and um, it is uh, follows kind of like a, a quantitative template in the sense that we are trying to build an explanation of reality that is in the form of, of propositions that might be tested in the future. In terms of the four paradigms, this belongs to the functionalist paradigm because we have um, the, the uh, idea is that the reality is the same for everybody and uh, we are not trying to change anything. This is, a, in, uh, this is a field research study because the researchers actually go to field, go to these companies, make interviews, observe what is going in the companies, collect documents from the companies and so on. And this is inductive research. The idea being that there, there's some observed empirical regularity. For example, power centralization and politics tend to go together. And then from that empirical regularity that the researcher observes, they generalize to a, a theoretical proposition. For example, power centralization causes politics. The qualitative research process is very much visible in this case. So uh, the cases are data collection, data processing, and data analysis, uh, they go hand in hand. So one guides the other. And there is uh, updating of the injury protocol. There is in adding more cases. And then once uh, the researcher decides that no more cases are needed, or I'm not learning anything new from additional cases, then uh, the, there's theoretical saturation, which refers that you are done with the study and it's time to report it. In quantitative studies, data analysis typically follows uh, a template. Like if you have a, a survey data, you would use factor analysis to test for reliability and validity. You would do regression analysis to test for the main hypothesis, controlling for alternative explanations. In qualitative research, the method sections tend to be fairly long in the data analysis part. And the reason is that there is no like standard operating procedure for qualitative research. Instead, the qualitative researcher needs to explain in detail what they're doing and why. And these explanations are typically in chronological order. And um, uh, they, it starts by saying that they were first quantifying the cases. So they were looking at this politics being, up, uh, being uh, applied in this case or not. Is power being centralized or not? And then uh, they seek associations from the data. Then they develop profiles. This is also another very common uh, technique for analyzing qualitative case study data. So if you do interviews, then you might write a summary of what you learned from those interviews. So you write like a case story of the company, like what is going on. Then they did the same for different decisions. And uh, when you think about politics and decision making, then uh, Looking at the cases is one important thing, but looking at the actual decision processes is, is another one. And writing down how you think the decision processes unfold based on the interviews is a, a very good analysis strategy here. Then uh, they develop timelines. So what is the sequence of events that occurred? What happened first and what happened then? And this kind of, of sequence of steps might indicate that there is a causal process going on that follows those st same steps. Once they had uh, completed this within case analysis, they moved to between case analysis. So they, they compare pairwise. So look at cases where politics are, are applied and how are these cases similar? How does a case where politics is applied uh, differ from a case where politics is not applied? And this is a very iterative process. So you have to go through the analysis process many, many times and your theory develops. Initially, you might have an idea and then that idea might either be rejected based on further analysis or it might be clarified based on further analysis until you settle to the final theory that you have. Then uh, you compare with prior research. The idea with prior research is that 
our analysis of data is always influenced by prior theory because researcher is never a clean slate in this kind of design. Instead, you use prior theory to inform your interpretations of what's going on in the data. One important feature that differentiates between, uh, this kind of study from more interpretive study is how you deal with conflicts. If two interviewees tell you two different versions of reality, then uh, you are treating that as an error in your data, basically. So if, if one person says that power is centralized, another one says that power is not centralized, you, you're not trying to understand why these people perceive the same reality differently, like an interpretive researcher would do, but you're instead trying to get to the truth of it. So this is kind of like, like you were in a courtroom where the defendant and the victim are saying uh, two different things and then you look at different forms of evidence to try to understand what really happens. And uh, this is called triangulation. So you're looking at different forms of evidence to try to reconcile when your interviewees are explaining the same thing in different ways. Importantly, data are never perfect, so the data never fully, ex uh, your theory never fully explain the data, but there are some anomalies and for transparency this should be reported. Let's look at how evidence is reported in this kind of study. And um, I'm looking at uh, the proposition one. The, the greater the centralization of power and chief executive, the greater the use of politics within top management team. So um, centralization of power causes uh, politics in the top management team. And then uh, there's an elaborate theory of why politics then leads to decreasing performance. Let's take a look at how the qualitative evidence is reported in this paper. And I emphasize that this is not the only way of, of reporting qualitative evidence, but it's more about this realist case study. A general principle is that it's not a good practice to just say that you went to a case and you came to the opinion that power is centralized, because that convinces, that relies on, on your own interpretation being trustworthy for the reader. And this is, this is something that um, I sometimes see master theses, you report that you went to a case and then you report your conclusion, but you don't report the data uh, through, uh, that led to that conclusion. A bit better is to us to say that I went to a case and then the CEO said that power is centralized. So you're basically reporting CEO's opinion of power centralization as a fact. And this is better because the CEO probably knows more about power centralization than a researcher does. But the problem is that the CEO also might be biased. Uh, instead, how we do in qualitative research, in this kind of research, we, we present evidence in as raw a form as possible. So we say that, that this, is what they, um, this is what the executives and this is what the CEO told us. And based on these interview quotes, we conclude that power is centralized in this organization. And anyone who reads these quotes can then uh, come up with their own opinion on whether they think power is centralized based on these data. So one, one principle in qualitative evidence, is, presenting qualitative evidence, is that you should present the evidence in as raw form as possible. You see these quotes of interviews are peppered throughout qualitative papers quite often for this reason. Another important principle is triangulation. So um, we might take that um, this interview data that says that uh, that talk about chief executive Jeff, and other executives says that Jeff is the decision maker. He's like the god in the company, and so these interviews uh, indicate that Jeff has uh, centralized power centralized into himself. Triangulation means that we try to come to the same conclusion or challenge this conclusion with other kinds of data. So these uh, researchers came up with uh, some, some qualitative data. They uh, had the interviews fill out forms where, with survey questions measuring uh, different level uh, forms of power centralization. And uh, then uh, they also looked the decision making processes, like who's the, the principal decision maker in its organizational function within the company, the organization chart. And this, you have like this organizational data, then you have interview data, and then you have quantitative data, 
all pointing to the same direction and this is called triangular so you look at the, uh, the question from multiple different perspectives through multiple different data and uh, multiple yeah multiple sources using different measures and the paper reports that uh, they had first quantitative data and then interviews corroborated these quantitative observations so uh, these are the general principles and then let's look at the actual evidence and with this kind of multiple case study you would first demonstrate association. So we would like to first show how power centralization occurs in these cases. So there's, there's a table and the table typically has uh, rows. Each case is one row and then each column is some kind of evidence. So there is uh, quantitative evidence, there's qualitative evidence, there's some kind of decision-making style coded from the data and then there's example quotes. And from these data, the researcher then concludes that power is centralized in the first four cases and it's not centralized in the last four cases. And we do the same for, polit for uh, politics and uh, there is some kind of uh, evidence for politics being coded from the data. So what, what aspects of politics uh, was uh, present in these companies, then some example quotes that illustrate the presence of these uh, forms of, of political activity and then whether politics practiced yes 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 no 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 so we can see that there's a clear pattern that those companies that their power is uh, centralized politics is also practiced so this shows association but how about then arguing the causal process arguing the causal process is um, done by explaining the causal process so explaining why politics occur and why politics uh, might be driven by the, CL, the power centralization. And you can find it in the article. So the short story is that they start by saying that the executives view politics as useful when the, the CEO, their power is centralized to the CEO. So the executives think that uh, politics is necessary for getting things done. Typically, the executives are also frustrated with the CEO. Like if the CEO is an autocrat, then the other executives band together and form a political coalition to challenge the CEO. And then politics were seen as necessary for getting things done. So this way, you, you present the evidence, like what did the interviews actually tell us? And then you tell a story of how uh, power centralization in CEO causes politics to emerge in the organization and then you have like this kind of short theory that is summarized in the proposition that centralization of power in the CEO causes politics in the organization. So in a nutshell this is a qualitative comparative case study and uh, the key elements of this kind of study is that you have multiple cases, then you have tables where you compare the cases, you establish associations between variables in your theory and then you have this kind of like a narrative explanation of the causal process uh, which you support by quotes from the interviews.